an inland navy. Hmm. That sounds pretty cool. Hey, is it like a like a like a river navy or a lake navy? A river navy. Hey, how, how many boats? A thousand. Wow, that is a big inland navy indeed. Yeah. Okay. March 9th, 1945. They have planned for what to do when they reach the Rhine for nearly a year, for it is a formidable obstacle. Perhaps even too formidable. Sure, there are boats, but, but the enemy can shoot them, and they can try to build bridges, but that too would be very dangerous. If only they could somehow take one of the Rhine River bridges intact. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week saw Manila liberated in the Philippines. Well, officially now on the 3rd. British, Canadian, and American combined operations from the Ruhr to the Rhine came to a successful end. U.S. 1st and 3rd Armies are also advancing towards that mighty river. On the Eastern Front, the Soviets smashed north through Pomerania, but the Germans finalized plans for a new offensive in Hungary. The American invasion of Iwo Jima continued taking ground slowly, and in Burma, the fight was on for the prize of Mike Tila. That fight ends this week. By the evening of the 3rd, the fight for the center of town ends when the last few dozen Japanese left commit mass suicide by drowning themselves in the lake. Bloody fighting continues the 4th and 5th, but by the 6th, the town is securely in British and Indian hands. Taking Mike Tila cuts the Japanese supply route to Mandalay and the north and clears the road down to Rangoon. Japanese commander Haitaro Kimura realizes, of course, that he has been fooled badly into losing Mike Tila, and he sends a lot of force south that he was going to use to fight 33rd Corps. So, on the 5th, begin Japanese counterattacks against 4th Corps, and 17th Indian Division is nearly cut off in Mike Tila, but air supply continues. So Kimura's obvious target is the airfield there. And from the 6th, his forces begin probing attacks to feel out the Allied defenses. Of course, British 14th Army Commander Bill Slim knows that Kimura is sending force southward, so he's ordered the three divisions of 33rd Corps to break out of their bridgeheads and hit Mandalay. The battle for Mandalay was always going to be a tough one even though the Japanese commander there thought its defense pointless, something he was commanded to perform purely for the city's prestige value. Interestingly, Slim shared this view, remarking that Mandalay was a news item, not a strategic target. Mandalay Hill, 250 meters high, dominates the northeast quarter of the city, and on the 8th, 19th Indian Division begins its advance up the hill. In northern Burma this week, on the 7th, X-Force units under Sun Li Jin take Lashio, and units under Daniel Sultan soon take Sipo, southwest of Lashio, and also just 150 kilometers from Mandalay, where 33rd Corps is and will be engaged. So it seems, at the moment, like they're taking the pressure, or some of the pressure, off of Slim. There might be something going on in the background, though. There's plenty of fighting this week in a place with no cities or towns at all, Iwo Jima. By this week, U.S. Marine casualties are at 16,000. For the Japanese, of the 21,000 they began the campaign with, but 7,000 remain alive. The Marines now have taken all three airfields. This week, the meat grinder is under heavy attack by the Marines. This is a group of separate defenses that reinforce each other. They've also been fighting for a rock formation bristling with artillery called Hill 382. It's surrounded early in the week. But then the three marine divisions are ordered to halt and consolidate, replenish, and rest. By the 8th, with renewed action, the Japanese are now all pushed back to within a mile of the northern end of the island. That evening, Samaji Inoye and between 1,000 and 1,500 men launch a bonsai charge against the orders of Japanese commander Tadamichi Kuribayashi. Inoue thinks the airfields will be lightly defended for some dumb reason, so the plan is to head south, destroy B-29s on the way, climb Mount Suribachi, and replace the Stars and Stripes flag with the rising sun. They end up instead 
justifying Kuribayashi's bonsai ban, some 800 Japanese dying. They do kill 90 Marines and wound 257 more, though. Today, the 9th, a Marine patrol reaches the sea, splitting the Japanese in two. The fight will now be two or even more separate bloody battles. There are many separate bloody battles going on in Europe this week as well. Here's a summing up of the general situation on the Western Front. As two dozen British, Canadian, and American divisions in 21st Army Group closed on the Rhine in the north, Hodges' 1st Army also made for the river between Cologne and Koblenz, with 13 divisions in three corps abreast. It is impossible not to be elated, the headquarters diary noted on March 3rd. Further south, 12 divisions in Patton's 3rd Army overran the rubble that once was Bitburg, then pivoted through the Saar Palatinate in tandem with 14 divisions from Patch's 7th Army. Together, they would attack on a 70-mile front along the flanks of the Hart Mountains. Any town that spurned demands from a bullshit wagon, a Sherman fitted with loudspeakers audible two miles away, was scourged with tank and howitzer shells until eventually a white flag or two popped up. The obstinate died. On the 3rd in the north, U.S. 9th and 1st Canadian Armies link up near Geldern, as I said last week. The next day, British 30th Corps from 1st Canadian takes the town. By the 6th, U.S. 9th Army has reached the Rhine on its entire front. Operation Lumberjack, the assault across the Erft River that began on the 1st by 7th Corps from 1st Army, continues, and on the 3rd, cavalry recon reaches the Rhine north of Cologne. On the 5th, 7th Corps assaults Cologne in force. This is Germany's fourth largest city, but of 770,000 inhabitants, but 10,000 remain. A couple dozen heavy bombing raids have hit the city hard the past couple years, and it is very much a dead city. It is, however, a dead city defended by snipers and men of the Volkssturm, and they have to be taken out block by broken block. Still, by noon on the 7th, the city west of the river has fallen. But the Americans cannot take its link to the east bank of the Rhine. A 400-meter segment of the Hohenzollern Bridge is blown into the river at noon on the 6th. It seems like a quick crossing of the river is out of the question. And now, a few words about the Rhine River. It flows north, which freaks people out, from Switzerland to the North Sea. It is the world's 15th largest river in terms of volume, right between the Euphrates and the Rhone. But it is fast, it is deep, and it is wide. Currents are often 15 or more kilometers per hour, and there is not one single place along its length where it is fordable at low tide. Thanks to the carpet bombing of German industry, it's actually unpolluted for the first time in a while, but also thanks to that bombing, there's so much wreckage littering the riverbed that the Allies cannot just take troop ships upstream from Nijmegen or anything like that. There are, or were, 31 bridges over the mighty river in Germany, most already demolished. But the Allies have been making plans to cross the Rhine since even before D-Day. Exhaustive studies examined bank current, weather, and ice conditions. Army engineers scrutinized historical hydrology data, aided by intelligence agents in Switzerland, and daily gauge readings intercepted in German radio broadcasts to river pilots. More than 170 models of the Rhine were built, and a hydraulics laboratory in Grenoble conducted elaborate experiments. A Rhine River flood prediction service opened in January. Mindful of the Ruhr debacle, diplomats pressed the Swiss to protect seven headwater dams with soldiers and artillery. They've had river pilot training for hundreds of men, and they've literally built an inland navy for taking men by the hundreds of thousands across the mighty river. Seriously, by now, just the forward depots have over a 1,000 assault boats, 124 landing craft, 6,000 bridge floats, 2,500 outboard motors, and enough bridging equipment for 60 bridges. However, it would be a lot easier to capture a bridge intact than to have to build their own. The town of Remagen has been around since the days of Julius Caesar, and it has a relatively new bridge over the Rhine, built in 1918 and named after Erich Ludendorff, quartermaster general and 
nearly dictatorial commander of the Imperial German Army at that time. It's like 300 meters long, and it's pretty wide. It has two train tracks crossing it side by side, which of course can be covered so it's good for road vehicles. To the east, the train tracks head into the Dwarf's Hole, a tunnel dug through a 200 meter high hill. Of course, the Germans are well prepared to blow this bridge. In fact, it is wired with 60 boxes for explosives and has been for a while. The wiring goes down into the tunnel where the firing switch is, pretty well protected from any air attacks. Hitler has ordered that the explosives themselves not be placed on bridges until the enemy is within like, like 10 kilometers or so, so they don't get accidentally blown to pieces by enemy bombers. This actually happened last October to a Cologne bridge. In the town itself, retreating German soldiers are streaming across the bridge along with refugees and livestock. There are under 1,000 active defenders left in Remagen. Most of them are Volkssturm, so many are very young or, or pretty old, and all are fairly new recruits. German defenses at the Remagen Bridge were fatally flawed because of a confused command structure and a shortage of troops. On March 1st, 1945, command of the Remagen sector was transferred to a new Bonn sector command under General Major Walter Bosch. On visiting Remagen, Bosch was shocked at the poor state of its defenses and requested the reinforcement of the bridge area with at least one regiment, which Model refused since he feared an attack on Bonn, not Remagen. The afternoon of the 6th, Bosch orders the charges to be placed since there are Americans in the area, but it does take time and there are separate elements to the demolition, like, like there's a big charge under the earth approach ramp at the west end. This is a preliminary charge and has a separate detonation circuit from the other charges that blow the actual bridge. Also, the evening of the 6th, Bosch is called to take over command of 53rd Corps when its commander is taken prisoner. So at 1 o'clock that night, Remagen command is transferred to Otto Hitzfeld, whose headquarters are 35 kilometers away, which is twice the distance away US 9th Armored Division's lead elements are. He has orders to attack 9th Armor, which he thinks are pure fantasy since his units are isolated behind 9th's spearheads. But when he suggests to command defending at Remagen instead, he is denied this. But he at least sends Major Hans Scheller to Remagen to set up a defensive perimeter around the bridge, which is the escape route for Hitzfeld's 67th Corps, right? Okay. The Night of the Sixth. U.S. 3rd Corps Commander John Milliken tells 9th Armored Division Commander John Leonard that if he can take the bridge intact, his name will go down in history, go down in glory. Well, he sends in armor and infantry the 7th, and they pretty easily overcome resistance in the town itself. Scheller arrives at 11 a.m. and soon gets word that armor is approaching, but he resists entreaties to blow the bridge. And as the Americans near the bridge, they're hit hard by enemy fire. German soldiers ran this way and that along the bridge ramp. Three junior officers argued over whether the demolition order should be put in writing. Shouts of blow the bridge carried over the waters and at length a captain shouted, everybody lie down. He turned the key to the firing switch. Nothing happened. He turned it again and again without effect. A German sergeant sprinted 90 yards onto the bridge, lighted the primer cord by hand, and pelted back to the tunnel, chased by bullets. And now the bridge explodes. Or not. There is a boom. There is dust and smoke. The bridge shudders, but it does not blow. This is just the preliminary charge at the West Bank, which creates a crater to prevent vehicles entering the bridge, like, like tanks. The eastern end charge is also blown, but the 700 kilos of explosives to blow the bridge itself are not. And the Ludendorff Bridge is still very much intact. The main demolition circuit is inoperable, and the Americans race onto the bridge, cutting wires and throwing charges into the river. Tanks blast the German positions on the hill to the east. And by the late afternoon, there are 120 Americans across the Rhine. By nightfall, there are three companies of rifles. At midnight, nine Sherman tanks make their way across. By the evening of the 8th, 8,000 men have a bridgehead three kilometers wide and one and a half deep. Today, construction crews begin work on a floating bridge a few hundred meters north 
downstream. One of the lingering mysteries of the capture of the Ludendorff Bridge is why the explosive charge failed to detonate. The circuit had been last tested that afternoon and had worked. It is possible that the charge was rendered ineffective by sabotage, by tank fire against the bridge, or a combination of factors. What is certain is that the Allies now have an intact bridge across the Rhine. Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower says the immediate priority now is to build up the bridgehead. The loss of the intact bridge is a catastrophe for German command, though they are slow to react, and the news doesn't even reach command for hours. Commander in the West, Gerd von Rundstedt, then orders the bridge destroyed. A hundred artillery pieces are soon pounding away at it from afar, scoring three hits today the ninth and punching a crater in the road deck. Eisenhower says he'll assign five divisions to cross here. They are to then advance to the Autobahn 12 kilometers beyond. Today, the 9th, 1st Army also takes Bonn and Godesberg on the river, and units from George Patton's 3rd Army reach the Rhine at Andernach. The Americans are also on the move this week in Italy. Well, them and the Brazilians. Phase 2 of Operation Encore goes off this week, the 3rd to the 9th. You may remember Phase 1 a couple weeks ago, launched by the U.S. 10th Mountain Army and the Brazilian Expeditionary Force. They are at it again, and it begins with an American advance that soon faces German reinforcements because smiling Albert Kesselring, who's recovered from injury enough to be back in command, thinks this might be a big drive to reach Bologna. The German counterattacks fail, and the Americans reach the ground west of Vergato, and the Brazilians clear the area to the east. The operation will officially end tomorrow, and this is also the end of the Gothic Line campaign. The Allies will now prepare for a big spring offensive. There are offensives currently in progress on the Eastern Front. The combined one by Konstantin Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front and Georgi Zhukov's 1st Belarusian Front that really kicked into gear late last week continues this week. Zhukov's forces, they're really pushing this week. They reach Kohlberg the 4th, and also finally fight their way into Stargard the 5th. The two fronts make contact near Kohlberg, then get busy sweeping along the Baltic coast, with Rokossovsky closing in on Gdynia and Danzig as thousands upon thousands of refugees try to escape them to both the east and the west. It's pretty crazy, and it's going to take time to reach Gdynia and Danzig. Meanwhile, German 3rd Panzer Army has been pushed by Zhukov's advance into a bridgehead east of Stettin. Hey, last week, I talked about the attack plans for German Operation Spring Awakening in Hungary and some numbers of the pretty serious force the Axis have to execute the operation with. A major goal of the plan, as I said, is to split Fyodor Tolbukhin's 3rd Ukrainian Front in two. The Soviets have seriously underestimated their enemy here in both size and planning, and they did not recognize the importance of their Hron bridgehead, which the Germans threw them out of. It began to dawn on the Soviet high command that something drastic was afoot. Clearly, the situation of Soviet troops along the northern reaches of the Danube had worsened, and this required immediate changes in Soviet operational planning. But not until the end of February did Soviet High Command decide that 6 Panzer would launch its attack in the area of Lake Balaton and strike at 3rd Ukrainian Front. Well, they know more specifically when and where as of late last week, thanks to a couple of Hungarian deserters. But Tolbukhin has been building up his defenses. He has three main defense lines, with the main defense belt like six or seven kilometers thick, the second line like eight kilometers back from the first, and the third more than 20. He's had real problems with the weather and ice in the Danube, but guess what? They've set up an overhead cable car railway system for ammunition and supply transport across the river to the front and pipelines for gasoline. Tobukin has just over 400,000 men. He's got 7,000 big guns and mortars and 407 tanks and self-propelled guns. They do also have two tank corps, one mech corps and one cavalry corps, and 17th Air Army has 965 planes. The attack begins as expected the night of the 5th, with a prelude south of Lake Balaton. The morning of the 6th, the main attacks go off after a 30-minute artillery barrage and airstrikes. This is by 6th Army and 6th Panzer Army, 
who by the way are often called, including by me, 6 SS Panzer Army, but they never actually have gotten an SS designation. The overall attacks are heavy and face massive resistance and they do grind forward the 6th and 7th some 8 kilometers into the Soviet defenses south of Lake Velense. On the 8th, they have 250 tanks in action between the two lakes. And 1st SS Panzer Corps has driven ahead nearly 30 kilometers to the west of the Sarvis Canal. Today, the 9th SS Panzer Division is thrown in and there are now 600 German tanks and self-propelled guns in action south of Velense. And they are widening their breach in the Soviet lines and have pushed through over 20 kilometers. The situation as the week ends is pretty serious for Tolbukhin. As for the supporting attacks, which is what those prelude attacks were the beginning of, attacks by 2nd Panzer Army from east of Najikaniza towards Kaposvar to try to draw away Soviet force facing the main thrust fail, and 2nd Panzer gets beaten up by Soviet 57th Army. German Army Group E's attacks against 1st Bulgarian and 3rd Yugoslavian armies do cross the Drava and do advance some, but after a few days of fighting, the Germans just don't have the force for more and pull back across the Drava. The Germans played out their part with near somnambulistic concern. Wohler dutifully called attention to the danger to the north flank and to 6 SS Panzer Army's weakness in infantry, but no one protested the pointlessness of conducting a major offensive merely to gain ground that most likely could not be defended. Well, maybe because everyone is aware of the pointlessness of telling Hitler he's making a mistake. With those words to ponder, here are quite a few notes to end the week. On the 3rd, the Allies try to destroy V-2 rockets and their launching equipment near The Hague, but navigational errors mean they bomb and destroy the Bezoidenhut quarter, killing 511 Dutch citizens. On the 4th, Finland declares war on Germany, backdated to September 15, 1944. On the 5th, 15 and 16 year old boys from the class of 1929 are called up to serve in the German army. The 8th and 9th, the German garrison on the Channel Islands raids Granville on the Cotentin, sinking four merchant ships and an American warship. Also on the 9th, there are rumors of a possible American invasion of Indochina, so the Japanese overthrow the Vichy French Jean de Coup government and proclaim an independent empire of Vietnam under Emperor Ban Dai, and with a government run by Prime Minister Tran Trong Kim. De Coup has been governor since June 1940. Kim and his ministers won't meet until May, but a priority is a resolution to rename the country Vietnam. Also the 9th comes the firebombing of Tokyo. 334 bombers drop 1,650 tons of incendiaries, raising a huge firestorm in a city with houses largely made of wood and paper. The death toll is at least 80,000 and perhaps as high as 120,000. This is part of a tactical change. See, under Curtis LeMay, They've now abandoned even the pretense of precision bombing, and area bombing is very much the order of the day. As always, this sort of thing is covered in depth in our War Against Humanity series, so check that out for all the details. There's also this. Today, on March 9th, Helmut Reimann, Commander Berlin Defense Area, signs the basic order for the preparation to defend the capital. It is full of Hitler's rhetoric, that is for sure. Defend Berlin to the last man and the last shot. Fight with fanaticism, imagination, every means of deception, cunning and deceit, and with improvisations of all kinds, on, above, and under the ground. That, that's sort of standard Hitler stuff. Berlin is indeed to be another fortress town. With outer defenses 30 kilometers from the center, another ring about 15 kilometers, and an inner defense that follows the S-Bahn. There are eight pie-piece shaped sectors, each with its own commandant and a citadel sector at the center. Those commandants, however, won't actually command anyone until they get the code word Clausewitz, which means the enemy is approaching. After that, they will then just command whichever troops or Volkssturm happen to be in their sector and whichever ones then come in or are driven in from outside. That seems a bit loose, yeah? Well, 
German high command is well aware that if Germany can be defended at all from the east, it's along the Oder Neisse River line, and not the line of the mighty Berlin S Bahn. And yet, so far, that river line has been neglected. Mainly because Hitler has still thought he has strategic offensive choices, like attacking in Hungary. So why worry about defense? Meanwhile, the enemy is now approaching and even at the Oda Nysa line. The results of that are that we, you and I, or you and us, get to wait with bated breath to see who does what first. Will Hitler build mighty defenses in time? Will he order a scorched earth policy during a retreat into Germany? Or will he not want to destroy things so that German troops can use them when they take them back? Will Zhukov and Konyev suddenly cross the rivers and head for Berlin? Will Stalin give the order? Will the Western allies suddenly break through like they did in Western France and steamroll all the way to Berlin? That could happen too. So many questions. And really, right now, so little time. Hey, if you want to cast your mind back a few years and learn more about the nuts and bolts of the Red Army and how it was organized, you can check out the special we did back then when it was the Germans who were advancing. Leander Michels or Michaels is the Time Ghost Army member of the week this week. It is the army that finances all of our productions. And you too can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned officers. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.